today I'd like to welcome Mary Louise Mazzani. We like to call her Maz. And I'm just going to go over a brief little intro of who she is and all of her achievements so far. But I don't have two hours, so I'm just going <laughs> to yeah. I'm gonna cut out a couple That's because okay. you're a very accomplished woman. And, Thank you. Um, I'm honored to call you a friend. Likewise. And I'm so glad that you're local, too. Like, okay, so just to let the audience know, Mary Louise Mazzani, um, we call her Maz. She does the Fast Maz camps, and we're going to go over what she has accomplished. But I was introduced to you because you trained my daughter in track. Correct. And we're going to talk about a lot of important things today, not only about athletics, but about parenting. Yep. And I, that I think is super important. Okay. Right. So let's start out with, we'll go back to local, a local ESPN organization um, awarded you the Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, in 2011, this is my favorite one. You were the first female ever inducted into the PA Track and Field Hall of Fame. And you're going to hear that as a theme First female, first female. Um, now, this is a national award. You were a nominee for the National Disney Hand Teacher. We should also say that you were a teacher in the public school system for, don't tell me, 38 years, if yes. I remember correctly. Yes. Okay. Which you deserve an award for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, people are going to get to know me, but my older daughter is a nurse now. And I always say, uh, nuns. Teachers and nurses, I think they're all the same because seriously, like what you guys do. Um, you were selected to Who's Who Among America's Teachers. You were the first female recipient of the Person of the Year Award by the PA Track and Field Coaches Association. The first ever female recipient of the Lycoming County Brotherhood Award. A local school um, where you taught, you were the recipient of Teacher of the Year. My gosh, it goes on and on. Uh, honorary women's high school referee for Penn Relays. Penn Relays is huge. Member of the National Executive Committee of the High School Women's Development Group of USA Track and Field. You served as a coach of the USA East Region mm -hmm. staff for the U.S. Olympic Sports Festival meet. That's crazy. I didn't yep. know that. In Colorado. Um, wait, there's more. I'm just not. I'm just not going to keep going on and on and on. But if you're watching on YouTube and not listening, you can clearly see <laughs> what we just went through. Is there anything you'd like to say about any of those? Like, what was your favorite? What was your, not to say one was less than the other, but what was the one that you were most honored to receive? Well, well first of all, it's obvious I've been truly blessed. And to receive an award outside of just the reward that you get for coaching and teaching is monumental itself. I think the fact that I was the first woman inducted into the Pennsylvania Track and Field Hall of Fame was huge. And the other one that I think is really huge is I was selected by the uh, Secondary School Committee USA Track and Field to be one of the coaches of the Olympic Sports Festival East Region staff. And that was huge out in Colorado. Now, how how do you... How does one have to even be nominated, let alone win? Like, do, do other peers have to nominate you? Do your athletes that you coach? No, nobody nominates you okay. for these awards. These awards are based on accomplishments. And those accomplishments then go back to my kids, my athletes. They made me look good. Okay. And consequently, you know. But at the same time, I was fortunate enough to have Penn State coaches take me under their wing. Three coaches in particular, Terry Jordan, Gary Schwartz, and uh, Harry Groves. Two of them were Olympic coaches themselves. Wow. And it was their fostering, and I would go up and I would work camps for them. And through them, I was seen by a lot of nationally recognized people. Okay, that who makes then, sense. Who then became familiar with my program and watched. Well, let me ask you something because then you that brings up a good point. When did you start coaching track? Like how far into your teaching career were you and what prompted you to even start? Well, what was interesting is my teaching career started in 1976 and 77, that school year. In 1972, Title IX came into being. So the school that I was at then, because of Title IX, started introducing all these women's sports that they had never had before. In case, in case people don't know what Title IX is, can you just briefly explain it? Title IX was the act that 
that indicated that whatever you had for male sports, there had to be equality in terms of you had to have female sports as well. And that didn't come into effect until 1972? Yeah. I didn't realize that was so, yes. I mean, it's not recent to younger people, but like I was alive in the 70s, right, so I didn't right. realize that it took that long to, wow. And what was interesting was when I got hired at this school, they said, uh, pick two sports because you're coaching too. And they knew that I had a background in running, but not, when I was in high school, this was a, a very kind of intramural kind of participation and competition. There were no organized sports for women. That's exactly what we're talking about. So consequently, it wasn't like I was some big time athlete. I didn't have those credentials. And I'm not ashamed to say that. Because, well, to be fair, you didn't have the opportunity to show off right. your talent or skill because it wasn't there. Right. And therefore, I made sure that I was going to do it the absolute very best by learning as much as I could. And that's when I started to go to clinics. I got involved with Penn State Coaching. They took me under their wing, and it just flourished from there. So they told me, well, you got the teaching job, and you're the head track coach, too. Okay. <laughs> so, boom. No pressure, though. <laughs> no, no, no pressure. No pressure. So you, but, you, let me just point out that you were really um, living through a time that many of us will never know. You were figuring everything out as you went. Yep. You were a trailblazer. You were creating opportunities for a demographic, women and girls, that right. never had those prior. Correct. And you um, you didn't have any guidance. You were just, yeah. So that makes your story even more amazing. Well, you know, and I was told I was going to have all this help from the uh, current coaches that were in place at that time did not happen. Not so, that this matters, but I'm just curious. Were they all men? Yes. Okay. And so consequently, I decided I was going to do it on my own, and I was going to do it right. And that's why I've always believed in the quote, if it is to be, it is up to me. Oh. And therefore, you know, we took it. You and, ruined and, my last question. But that's okay. I <laughs> I'm am kidding. I was but but consequently, you and, you know, and I figured uh, I'm just going to do it right. I came from a family that believed in hard work and perseverance and gumption and guts. And if you're going to do it, you're going to do it well, and you're going to do it right. How many times did we hear that growing up? Because uh, I know we have similar backgrounds. Yes, absolutely. If you're going to do something, do it right or don't even bother. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And that has always been part of my character because I was brought up that way. Which parent do you feel influenced your, your life more? Like, where do you think you get most of that? Um, discipline and gumption and like stick to itness. Where do you get that from? Do you you think? know, it's really interesting because I would say that both my parents, but my mother was the one that really pushed the idea. You know, you're not going to quit. This is how it is. Deal with it. Pull up your pants. Get moving. Good. We're not hearing it. My dad was the real competitive one. Hmm. Okay, if you're going to do it, you're going to win. Don't come home if you don't win. And I heard that more times than I can tell you. So when we so, used to joke around with Sophia and say, you're not getting supper tonight right. if you don't get first place. Exactly. That was kind of really true in your exactly. house. Exactly. <laughs> that was true in my house. True in my house. Oh. And, you know, I would play. I played tennis a lot in high school and I played oh, okay. tennis in college because that was one of the women's sports they had. And at high school one time I was losing a match and my brothers were standing behind the fence and they said... If you lose, don't go home. Oh Boy, that just gosh. turned that around. Yes. And so. see, a lot of people, a lot of kids nowadays with that sort of discipline, I feel they um, they cower to it instead of rise to the occasion to it. And I'm there's a multitude of factors why. It's not any yeah. one person's fault. It's a combination of just the world we live in now and society and, you know, how blessed we are to live in this country with all, everything that we have. And it really, it just, it really is disheartening to me. We have to do a better job of teaching kids how to be responsible, how to be accountable, how to be tough, how to know that you have to fail. Yes. Failure is part of growing and nobody likes it. And I have been there, but consequently, if we don't teach them that, then when it happens, they don't know how they to crumble. deal with it. I know. Failure is like frowned upon now. I, I know. And we can't. They're, they're, they, they just, that was something very hard for me to get out of my girls. Like, yeah. it's okay if you fail. No, it's not. It's a, it, 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 Again, I don't know where, I, I don't want to lay blame, but it's a society thing. 
that I don't know where they learned along the way that if they failed, they were a loser forever. Yeah. And it's just so not true. Look at all of us. Right. Look at how, look at what we did when we were younger and everybody's fine. Like, <laughs> right. Well, and the, and the thing is this too, you know, we're in a situation now that being tough should be a characteristic that everybody has. Not everybody's going to get a trophy. It doesn't work that way. We don't teach kids real life things. Trigger point, trigger point. No, I'm just kidding. No, that's true. (laughs) So getting back to your childhood, um, how many siblings did you have? I had three brothers. One of them has passed, so I've got two now. That's right. I think I knew that. Yep. So you were the only girl. Yes. And your parents were tough. Very tough. Yeah. Now, were they themselves immigrants or were your grandparents? My grandparents on both sides were immigrants. Both sides Italian? Yes. Okay. Both sides Italian. They were both very tough, but very loving and very caring and very nurturing. And I know people that know me get sick of hearing me talk about this, but I just think Italians have mastered that skill. They do. They're tough, but loving. Yes. (laughs) Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, okay. So out of all of the awards that I went over, was there one that I didn't mention that you might have wanted me to mention or did I kind of hit the highlights you hit the highlights highlights. that's fine so you started coaching track pretty much as soon as you became a teacher absolutely the first year wow did you you had to have felt overwhelmed it was very overwhelming just starting as a brand new teacher and uh, you know getting a classroom and getting six classes and learning a curriculum and then having to go outside and coach track and field as well and I coached another sport too softball for girls was just instituted at that it was softball and it was track and field that were two of the big ones they had always had tennis and swimming so consequently I had to be the assistant in softball now once softball got moved from the fall to the spring where I had track and field Mm -hmm. then I became the cross-country coach so the sports you did in high school, of course, you know, they weren't competitive yet at, at that time, but you did tennis. Yes. Was there anything else well, available to girls? I, I would go point? to like, you know, the kids call them AAU meets now. I would do that in track. I would go down to the to uh, the Junior Olympics in Philadelphia. Oh, wow. Track, you yes. did? Yes. So, you know what? I've known you for so long and I can't believe I've never asked you this, but yeah. I like that better. Yes. Um, What was your main event that you liked Sprints. to do? Sprints. I was a sprinter, the 100, the 200, yep. Wow. Yes. It just sucks that that wasn't available for you to be competitive, but it turned out amazing. Tennis was great, and I ended up being a Mid-Atlantic Conference champion in tennis in college. Yeah, so that was Well, did you, when you had to first start coaching in high school, did you do boys and girls or just girls? Just girls track. Okay, all right. Did you ever coach boys along the way? Not in track. I coached boys and girls cross country. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Because the program, boys and girls, cross country was one program, and we had a, before I took it, it was a male head coach, and I was the assistant, and then when he left, I became the head coach, and a male became the assistant. Okay. So, and answer this however you want, um... What would you say was your biggest challenge? I'll start first with your teaching career, being a female trailblazer. Like, did you come across any hurdles or obstacles? And when you were you ever told no, and then you you had to turn that around? In teaching, not so much. Although the department that I was in, uh, there was only one other female. So there really? were probably yes, eight or oh nine gosh. males and one other female, and it was like that for twenty years. See, it was like that for 20 years. See, when you don't years. grow up like that, like you don't realize, this is why it's so important for even my generation and my kids to hear this. We need to know about people like you that made opportunities so available. Well, and you know, the, the, the coaching part was the hardest part because we were now entering a man's world where boys sports were already integrated into the system and boom, out come these new girls sports and, you know, I was going to get all this help. Uh, did not happen. Uh, so now, just just out of curiosity, how many kids were you coaching just by yourself at first, being well, a new teacher, a young woman? We had 80 kids out for track. Now I had an wow. assistant, but we okay. had 80 kids out for okay. track, you know. But, but you know. That's still a lot. That is right. so many to keep. Right. And, and, you know, I did not grow up in the Me Too movement. I did not. Right. And you know what? I'm telling you. What has transpired has made me tougher. You know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. 
Kelly Clarkson. And, and consequently, it was very, very tough because mm-hmm. as you indicated, I had to work twice as hard mm-hmm. to prove myself, to prove that my kids were worthy of everything that they were accomplishment, accomplishing. I had to prove that what we were doing was just as important as what the boys were doing. Now, there was absolutely no problem between the boys and the girls, you know, but with the coaching, it, it was very difficult. And um, I consider myself taking that strength and perseverance from my family and moving forward uh, because I was upset one day and came home and my mother said, and your point is what? <laughs> if you're upset, go do something about it. And, you know, from then, wow. on, from then on, I just, I was more vocal than I had ever intended to be, learned to stand up for myself, learned to be more aggressive in initiating the things that we needed. And the only time things changed is when the program grew and the girls became so accomplished that people knew Mm -hmm. I was not going away. Isn't it always like that? Yep. Every time I hear a story about a trailblazer or someone that did something that no one else did, especially women, how long did that take you to shut people up, basically? Um, You know, if I started... how many years? 76, 77, I want to say probably it would take a good 15 years. Oh, my god! Yes, it would take a good 15 years because all the while we were working... Well, we became the first girls team to ever beat state college high school girls team ever ever and once we did that which was in 83 things started to turn around a little and boy after that we just kept moving up and um our athletes became nationally ranked and so on and so forth and then people thought well maybe this program is for real maybe she is for real and and that is so important to to also transfer that that thought process to the athletes because i know Many times, Sophia would come home, maybe upset about something in one sport or another, and we would always say, "Just keep your mouth shut and yep. put the put the points on the board." Right, right. Because you, the only way to shut them up is with your stats. Exactly. You can't shut right. them up whining, right, or complaining or not showing up. You right. shut them up by showing up and putting points on the board. Exactly. Only exactly. way. You don't have to tell people how good you no. are. They'll see it. Right. They'll see it. So what was, can you remember what your first um, huge accomplishment was with a female athlete? Like whether that be a district title, um, a state medal? Well, first of all, we won 20 consecutive district titles in track and field in 16 in cross country. Oh my gosh. All the years I was head coach in cross country. Yes. Wow. The first state champion that we ever had in our school was uh, Tammy Hurt, who was a, um, who was a black woman. So she was not only the first woman, the first black woman as well. And um, that, that was a huge, huge accomplishment. And then they all fell after that. You know, I just wanted to say we had, uh, we had individual, 15 individual and relay state champions over the years. And some of these, let's just stop state champion. This yeah. isn't qualifying. No. This isn't no. a medal. This no. isn't second, third, or fourth. Right. This is state champion. Yes. 15. Yes. We finished in the top wow. five in the state 10 of 20 years. Oh, my gosh. And finished See, in the top 10 12 out of 20 years. And we had... Um, and, it, and and let me say, too, we're a small town. Right. For people right. that don't aren't from here, or right. hopefully this will go... Yeah, you know, the more I do these, hopefully more people will see them. Um, we're a small town, so when you're going up against these big like Philly schools, oh yeah, and, and yeah. Such, oh absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And and the interesting thing is, you said about a struggle. Um, I had a girl that made a junior Olympic team, so she made the team, so on and so forth. For we, what do you remember? For track and field, it was in the four hundred. Four hundred. So, okay. do you think that we could get her picture in her? junior Olympic uniform to be hanging in the school? Mm. No. Do you know when I was on the East Region coaching staff for the Olympic Sports Festival team, they called the school and said, how many coaches have you ever had do that? None. 
well, she has a she has a uniform, a warm up. Why don't you acknowledge that? Nope. And what year was this? This was ninety four. So nineteen ninety four. So still in the nineties. Yes. No, they wouldn't. They would Female not acknowledge athletes it. Athletes were struggling to get the yes. accolades that the males yes. got. And I, I never knew anything about this. This came from the <sighs> Olympic Committee. Oh, the Olympic Committee. Yeah, told you. they're the, the secondary school committee. Yeah, and I had no idea, but it is so, what it is. So when I do these podcasts, it's a conversation. I never know what's going to pop up. I, I, you know, prepare a little bit, but I purposely don't over prepare. Because I like to be genuinely yeah. informed and shocked. And sure. I also want to point out that in this climate that we're in, the fact that in 1994 there was still a female athlete not getting the recognition that she should yeah. just goes to show how hard females have fought yes. on every sector from the big schools to the little schools to the public to the private yep. and the female coaches like yourself. And that's another thing I want to point out you were at a public school. You weren't handpicking your athlete. Right, exactly. That, that's another phono- right. That's another layer that makes all of the accolades that you just mentioned even more amazing. Right. And, and you know what? I think the thing, the point that I would like to make is rather than sit here and I, I'm not blaming men for all of this. Mm-mm. I'm not blaming men for all of this. It's when you get to that upper, upper echelon. Right. It's not the everyday. It's that upper administrative level. You know what I always say? Becomes... It's the system. It's not the boots on the ground. Exactly. Exactly. That is and my, that's an excellent point. That is my theory for everything. That is yep. my theory for teachers, yep. um, medical yes. professionals. Yes. God bless them. They are only doing what they're allowed to do. Exactly. And they're only in a culture that was created by someone other than themselves. Exactly. And how many times, there's so many great men, and how many times do these men probably go home and say to their wives, it just breaks my heart that these girls have to go through this or fight. And a lot of those men have daughters. Yes, exactly. And that's the point, too. And they want... They want a better climate for their daughter. Absolutely. So when they see, as you said, boots on the ground, mm-hmm. what's happening, they want that cultural climate mm-hmm. change. And there's a lot of men now, yes. I don't know if back in the 70s they were, but um, there's a lot of men now even fighting for it. We will always continue, men and women, to support our daughters, um, but it is the system. It is. And it who is. knows where that system got started, but... If we can just slowly keep chipping away with people like yourself and men that will join your um, your crusade, we can break that system absolutely. down. Absolutely, you know? absolutely, absolutely. Women certainly have more resources now. available to them now yeah. if something goes awry. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have been there, and there were no those none of those resources available. So I'm going to switch gears for a minute. Sure. Um, we already talked a little bit about the discipline with, with athletes and kids, but I want to get a little bit more into that because I've seen parents be too involved in right. their child's athletic career, and I've seen parents be too hard on their kids. So what, can you speak a little bit about how do you, as a parent, find that happy medium? Like, your mom sounds like she was a woman of little words but strong words. Yes, so how do you convey to your child, you're going to fail, you've got to feel the feelings, and then you've got to learn how to control your emotions and self-soothe and get over it and then get mad after all you go through all those emotions enough that you use that to fuel yourself to become better in any area of life, not just athletics, right. but your, later on your career. But then, man, I've seen... I've seen some heartbreaking stories, too. I remember being at track meets, and and a a dad was just laying into his daughter. My heart broke for her. Like, it was, like, uncalled for in front of everybody. He was swearing. Like, how do you find that happy medium? The happy medium has to be you've got to teach your kids what it is that is necessary to succeed. Okay? All those characteristics we've been taught, you have to teach them that. Then you've got to let them go. And you've got to let them go and experience Teachers in school, coaches, you've got to let them experience all of that and let let them know that this is a process. Now, if you think that your child is being treated unfairly, then you make a private appointment 
to see the person in charge. That's what you do. None of this should be displayed in the public. But you have to allow the leverage of teachers to do their jobs, especially in the classroom. You know, oh, my gosh, when I you, know. When you and I, if we got disciplined in school, we come home and would tell our parents, and our parents would say, well, the teacher would not scold you if you didn't do something wrong. I'm and sorry. I was more afraid of my parents than right. the teacher. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, that's yeah. another thing. They're not These anymore. kids yeah. today yeah. are not fearful of authority. And there is authority, and consequently, you do have to respect. We have to teach kids to respect that authority. We have to teach kids somebody else is in charge. You are not. You have to follow the rules. Okay, so if you go out for the team and you don't make it, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. then you have to deal with it. If, if you're, you're running an event and, and you, you know, you're disappointed, look at Lily last year falling falling mm. in the 800 meter final oh she was, was gonna i know win that event. so let's tell people who lily is so okay. lily is my cousin and her mother was my cousin and who her, um tragically passed away of and her cancer. mother was a state champion for me and her mother julia yes. was a state champion for you Correct. and when i watch lily run oh my she, god yeah, i just see just, julie yeah, like she yeah. does um she got that that skill honestly and she does work very hard at it uh and her siblings, her older sister, and her brothers are all such great kids. But um, what were we talking about? She runs. She runs the eight hundred, and two steps from the finish oh, line yeah. falls, and that was a state championship. And after she was done, I said to her, "What do you do now? You pick it up and you move on." And look what she has done at the University she, of Rhode Island. Oh, she's accolade kicking after butt and accolade taking names. after accolade, school yes. records. Her freshman year. And you know what? This is what I always used to say to my girls. Because I've been accused, as I'm sure you may have at some point, of not, of of moving too quickly to the next step. Like, my oldest has been quick to tell me, you don't let us at least have a moment. And so I've tried to get better as a parent at that. So now, well, not now, they're older. But then when I figured that out, I would say to them, I would open their door. They'd be upset or crying. I'd say, okay, you have today right. to feel your feels. Then when you wake up tomorrow, the key is you don't let it bleed into tomorrow. Right, exactly. Because you've got to work through those feelings and feel a little pity party for yourself, However, especially girls. However, the next day you've got to wake up and be like, okay, now I'm mad. Right. So it's only when wh wh I, I'm going to mess this up, but it's it's a, like a quote where like when you have a feeling, it becomes a thought. And then if yes. you let that thought become a behavior, right. Right. that behavior becomes your personality right. and that personality controls your life and where you go. And that's really scary. If you see that cascade of events, right. you got to stop it. And the thing about Lily is so she was two steps away from a state championship mm -mm. and she fell and she didn't win. She got a full ride. A full ride to the University of Rhode Island because she has other accomplishments that were outstanding enough to allow her to have that full ride. And therein lies what this is all about. You have got to pick yourself up. And we, shame on us if we don't teach kids how to do that. And no one event is ever going to ruin no. your career. No. And, and you know, I want to come back to something that you had said about... Um, with me with education, when I was interviewed for my teaching job, I went into that, it, I was sitting outside waiting to go in to be interviewed. And the supervisor of the department came up to me and leaned over and said to me, you know, you're the only woman we're interviewing for this job. And I thought, you gotta be kidding me. He did not say that to me. So I went in to be interviewed and there were 10 men all sitting in a circle. And I thought, here we go. And I said, to myself, I'm going to get this job. And I did. And it's been a wonderful career. I loved and, my teaching career. And if you would wonderful. have had a different upbringing, you yes. would not have had, you would have been like, forget it. I'm going to the I bathroom and cry. Then I'm going right, to go home. Right. I would have melted out there. It but is that's so what, hard now, not to get intimidated. Right. You know? But you know, they wouldn't say that today. No. 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 Which no. good. I'm glad yes. we've made progress Right. There. Absolutely. But to teach your children to not get intimidated, going back to what you said about have a private conversation if you feel your child right. is getting treated right. unfairly. Right. I, of course, age appropriate. But if you think they're old enough, which, you know, I mean, I say like 13 up, but that's just my opinion. 
to go in there and speak for themselves. I always encouraged my kids to do that first. Absolutely. If you have a problem with your teacher or the coach, yes, it's your problem, not mine. Right. You go in and talk to them first. Yes. If you don't get anywhere, then we'll try to have a civil conversation. Right. Exactly. Um, and like you said, it all it should always be civil and respectful. And then if you're not getting the results you want, follow a process and make a name for yourself and accomplish things. Not not you're not gonna get anywhere throwing a temper tantrum. Right. Exactly. And we have to teach kids to be tactful. Mm-hmm. You Thank can you. approach anybody. Strategery. If, yes. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yes. If if you're tactful. Yes. For heaven's sakes, I had kids come up and ask questions and so and they were wonderful and very tactful about it anybody will entertain something that is brought to them in good faith right but when you take it and you make it something that is going to infuriate and inflate and ignite you're in trouble well i have to challenge you on that point okay because in the generations that we grew up in or especially you i think maybe yes that was true but I find as though the emotional maturity is not there anymore, even with adults. So I find as though even when a child, not child, but like a teenager or somebody goes to a person of authority that you think in my day, all adults were the same. Like they all, you know, and then the adults are acting emotionally a little bit more immature than the actual child. That's disheartening to me as a parent. Yes. Because it's like, okay, so now we have adults that don't have emotional maturity or don't even know how to go back and forth with a kid like you said and i agree with you i agree because there are some times when when kids or students do approach and you think that they are trying to uh, start something or initiate something and then you become defensive and once you become defensive all bets are off it doesn't even if they're going to you as an adult in good faith if it's not on your agenda or what you want to do I just find that adults are just not handling it like they used to when I was a kid. I, that's just me. That's just my personal yeah, experience. I got you. But anyway. So. And people are like pyramids. The notice few on top would cr- crumble without the firm support of the many underneath. You I know, love that's that. basically, yeah. That's good. That's good. Do you have a favorite memory of when you saw an athlete that was just like counted out by everybody or maybe had an injury and they just fought and came back and won? Oh, I've, I've had so many of those. I had a girl one year that was racing against a girl that was ranked third in the country. Oh, my gosh. And, yeah, we were standing down by the fence, and the race started, and all the guys around me were saying, and not just because they were was guys. Was it like they 100 just, meter? No, or? it was 800 meters. How do you remember? You have oh, had, so let me interject. <laughs> if we had to count how many kids you coached, uh, it would be thousands and thousands. Yes, of, yes. And the fact that you remember this is so right. impressive to me. Right. But go um, on. But, <laughs> so it was interesting because... <clears throat> This girl was going to win, hands down. That's all everybody was talking about. And before my girl went out, I said to her, now, in order for you to win this event, you have to come through the 400 at such and such. You let her go. Let her go. Do not allow her to pull you out of your strategy. So they came around the first lap, and this girl's ahead, and I looked up at the clock, and my girl was right on. And I looked at those guys, and I said, this race is going to be over. They said, oh, yeah, we know. I said, yeah, but not who you think. I love it. She came around that turn, picked it up, came up the back stretch. All those guys are on the back stretch. She catches the girl on the top of the turn, and I'm out there yelling, put the hammer down. Yes. Put it down, and yes. she blew her away. Oh, my gosh. Blew her away. It was ranked nationally. Yes. Uh, absolutely amazing. I love a good underdog yep. story. Yep. And you brought up a good point because this is another thing that I, I've preached so much over the years is so much of anything again, but especially athletics and competition is mental. Absolutely it is. And I've seen the best teams and the best athletes talk themselves out of a win. And I've seen the right. underdogs talk themselves into a win. But you know, and it's funny because we had another, I have to tell you this, and we had another incident where we ran a four by 800 meter relay and everybody usually stacks that. You put your very best person last, your fastest person. Oh, yeah, okay? I remember that. That yes. was my favorite right. Favorite race that Sophia ran was the well, relay. That, that was, so fun right, to watch. Right. So, fun. so in the 4 by 8 okay. I knew that the way that we were going to win this if I put my fastest kid third. Okay. So we lined up on the line, and <clears throat> one of my nemesis came over to me and said, you're really going to run her third? Now, that was my fastest kid. Yep. He said, boy, aren't you gutty? Huh. Well, 
by the time we were all even on the second one, I gave it, they gave the baton to the third girl, my fastest girl. We had such a lead when she handed it off. We beat everybody hands down. He came over to me and he said, I can't believe you had the guts to do that. <laughs> And I said, look what happened. I love your guts. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but why? What was your strategy Well, the there? strategy was the girl that was running fourth was not shabby by any means. Okay. But I realized with the times of the other kids that I had that our best chance was if this third girl could get us enough of a lead and the oh, fourth girl could hold on. I see. Did they catch up to her a little? Yeah, but she still had but enough of enough. a lead. not enough. Wow. Yep, and we were ranked in the nation that year. Oh, my God. Yes. So, hey, so have you ever sat down and just added up all of the state medals from all of your athletes? Well, yes, we have. It's it's interesting because let me see. I have some of that awesome, for you good. here. We have had, um, as I said, fifteen individual or relay state champions, and we have had like fifteen all staters too. That's if you are not the state champion, but you still place within a certain, uh, like if you're in the top six, you're all state. Okay, gotcha, so. gotcha. So getting back to the mental state, and I know when Sophia was running track, you and I talked about this a right. lot. I, I really do wish, and I would love to see, and I'm sure there are some coaches out there in teams, school teams that do this, but I really would love to see it become mainstream, the mental part, instead right. of just always focusing on the the athleticism and, you know, of course it's all important, but I, I read a book by, and this is going to be, I'll, I'll have to put it, the name of the book on the video because I can't remember it, but he was the coach of the Lakers, if I'm not mistaken. And the minute you, you're a basketball fan, right? Or well, like, women's basketball or. Well, my niece wasn't WNBA champion on a WNBA championship team twice. That's right. That's yes. crazy. But um, so the coach, he started implementing meditation and then he started implementing uh, one practice a week where they were not allowed to talk. And then they did some weird things, not weird, but they did some like exercises in the dark to turn the lights off. And then they won like all these, you know, championship after championship. And that book stuck with me because it's just so important. Like we were just talking about how not only how you interpret what happens to you but how you prepare before right. you go out exactly we were we were in a van one time driving into the state championships and one of the athletes in the very back said here we go girls i hate it when people think they can beat us i love it yes she said i hate it when people think they can beat us and i said well then don't let them and look you at know, some of the greatest and, athletes, you yeah. know, men and women. And, and, you know they had that mental part down. Right. And, you know, when we're talking about this, I had been accused so many times of some of the coaches in my building, you're a win-at-all-cost person. No, I'm not. But do you think I'm going to take the kids out there and tell them to get second? We always used to say, if you can't get first, get second. If you can't get second, get third. Thank you. This is a team sport. I'm not going to teach them to lose. I know. I mean, that I know. that made no sense to me. Right. We dealt with it, you know. Right. We dealt with it and, and just went from there. I know. And I love that about you. And that's how Sophia's basketball coach was, too. He was the same way. We didn't win everything. Right. But he always expected that of them. Exactly. And and when And then when we didn't win, guess what? He wouldn't let him wallow. He'd be like, all right, here we go. We're going to get the next one. Listen, you know? that's, that's just another thing that we don't we do not do enough with young people. Expectations. Yes. You have to have expectations. Yes. Don't, don't settle for mediocre when yeah. you can be better than that. One of my favorite quotes is Medio mediocrity yeah. is the enemy of excellence. That's right. And I'm sorry, my biggest pet peeves are mediocrity and apathy. Absolutely. We, we, you and I have both lost so many people in our lives. Like yes. you don't, like life is so short. I'm going to start crying. <clears throat> but life is so short. Look at Julie, you know, yes. and look yep. at Lily's accomplishments and, yep. and, you know, and Julie's accomplishments, but her life was tragically cut short. And I just think if people could grasp that, they would try so much harder at stuff. And, you know. Even with my book, every yeah, athlete, I want to talk about that. every athlete that gave a testimonial said everything was inspirational, everything was positive, everything was motivational, everything was perseverance, everything was team. We all worked together. 
And do you know what kind of culture that you always um, put forth? And this is what I love. You commanded respect. You didn't demand respect. Yeah. Thank you. So you just, you loved on the kids and you were just so present with them and listened to them and looked them in the eye and, and, and you were so like, you were always rooting for them and you'd be screaming and, you know, in a good way, like for them. But yet when they didn't do what they had to, you, you laid down the hammer too. Exactly. But not in a demeaning way. Never demeaning. Like you don't have to put someone down to the way you bring out the best in anybody as a boss or you bring out the best in anybody as a coach is through love and, and to show and discipline right. and confidence show you yes. a confidence and in they them. can love and discipline can live together simultaneously right. right we had a girl that was a state champion that was hurt one year and state college came to run us and if you looked at it on paper without her points we were going to get beat and i said to the kids i said i said to the girls we're going to lay down and die can't lay down and die they're coming here we need people to step up if you step up, this will turn out positive. We beat them by 20 points. Oh, my god! And on paper, that should have never happened. Those kids rallied. See the power got, of the mind. Do you they, see it? They got themselves rallied up and ready to go and pushed and, you know, so on and so it's forth. It's the power of the spirit. It's the power uh, of the unbelievable. spirit. Unbelievable. Well, you remember when Sophia, so my daughter was a long jumper, and you co- she was a sprinter, but she wasn't as good in sprinting, but you coached her with agility and sprinting and all that along the years. But she was at the States, broken pelvis. Yes. Yeah, right. Competing. Competing. Yes, now, exactly. She should not have been, and we don't advocate for that. And, no, and to that's be fair, right. That's right. To be fair, we didn't realize it was broken. We thought it was just like a tear. And right, exactly. So, you know, her her doctor said, well, as long as it doesn't hurt. like, And, you know, she was like, well, it's, you know, it's not hurting too bad until she landed on the sand exactly but you know um that i mean maz with those injuries and she was always injured but you know with her hip and her pelvis who breaks her pelvis and still and still competes and you know and it's just you yeah you got to be smart about it and if we would have known how serious it was she wouldn't have done it but you've got to have that that thirst that's right for winning that's competition's right. a good thing when yes. it's in a controlled environment and when right. it's appropriate exactly it's a good e- thing exactly it, it adds so much to your character exactly and when you said about well okay when they lose which my kids did many 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 times right. what happens do, do you let them go cry about it no it you know when Sophia lost a few times guess what her and you know the gentleman that helped you Jeff that helped her with yes. her long jump yes They'd be the only ones at the track exactly. hours yeah. after practice because right. she was mad. Right. So she stayed after practice hours with him. Right. And getting back to what we were saying about kids, this is a funny story. So my older daughter was a dancer. I think I told you this before. And Sophia was playing softball. Both came home same day. I think Sophia lost like some big little league thing or and Gabriella didn't get um, a spot, uh, a solo in a dance recital. And they were both sitting on the couch. <laughs> <you know. laughs> and I looked at them both. They tell this story. They think it's so funny now that they're 20 and 22. I looked at them both and I said, oh my gosh, you tried your best. And the other team was just better than you today. That doesn't mean right. next time you might be better. Right. So today you're a loser and you're a loser. There you go. Good. <laughs> Good. And they were like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you're calling us losers. And they were upset at first, but now they're like, okay, right. we know why you did that. Exactly. And I was like, so get up. You get the That's solo right. next year, which she did. Right. And you win the championship, which their team did. And it's like, oh, my gosh, one moment does not define you. Exactly. And that's that's what we have to make kids understand. And we don't do a good enough job across the board of doing that. I will say, though, our little town produces so many great athletes. It's amazing. And I I will say it is refreshing. At least the parents I was around, they all had that old school mentality. Right. right. Um, So I didn't. um, Yeah, it was great. Like, yeah, I didn't have to experience that too much. Thank God. Um. But anyway, so let me see what else I have here for you. Gosh, we covered a lot. We sure did. Um, what? T- talk to us about what you are still doing right now. You're still part-time in the educational system yes. at a high school level and a collegiate level. I do curriculum work at a local high school for teachers, uh, implementing kinds of um, kinds of strategic programs that we want them to use to keep engagement moving and keep engagement as a big process 
in the education of our kids. And uh, I am also a field supervisor at one of the colleges where I go out and observe pre-student teachers. So, you know, teaching was um, my passion. Hmm. Everything that I've done has been with passion. And so I still get to go out and observe them and then, you know, give them tips on what it is they should maybe look at doing differently to improve that teaching so that when they student teach, uh, you know, they start to improve. So, yeah, Yeah, I'm still doing that. When was the first moment you said to yourself as a a child or a teenager, I want to be a teacher? Third grade. Yes. I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. Yeah. And I was always upset about it because all my friends in high school. Oh, wait, you were the one in the classroom that was always like when the teacher left the room to go to the bathroom. Mary Louise is in charge. No, are you? no, no. <laughs> Absolutely right. not. Absolutely. I always knew that I wanted to teach, though. Aww. I mean, and I, and I loved it. And even at the end of my 38th year, I waited until the end of May before I decided I was going to retire. And the only reason I did that is because uh, we were negotiating a new contract and the head of the union came to me and said, you are going to lose miserably in insurance mm. if you wait for this new contract. So that's why I So went. it was time to go. Yep. And then you just kept busy, of course. Yes, absolutely. So um, now, did you stop coaching school track at that point and yes. then you moved into like the private sector? Or? I have been coaching in one way, shape or form, whether it is organized school sports or otherwise for 47 years. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Yes. Yes. And I, I the thing I do now with teams is just I love to work with teams, uh, you know, trying to work on speed, agility and quickness. It's it's I know I love watching your camps. Yeah, it's just, you know, um, let talk a little bit about because this is another one of my pet peeves talk a little bit about how important it is for all children to be doing a camp like yours not listen yeah lily's at college and track my daughter went to college you know not everybody is going to go to college and play a sport or be in a sport and not even everybody's going to be the best high school athlete that's not what it's about it's about keeping active and and those motor skills and the proprioception right. and the you know there's exactly. The, exactly. the mind body connection you you can tell that you know i mean with kids nowadays even a lot of what you do in running you have to know how to skip they don't know how to skip yeah so don't they you love when people go well it's just running oh my gosh there's it's <laughs> there's so much to people, just running in people air people are willing yeah. to go to the ends of the earth for batting lessons and this is no this is not a criticism you know all these specialized things Running but is, they forget. They a, think it's running natural. Running is right. specialized. Right. Yes. There are things that you can do to enhance your running. That Absolutely. old adage of either you're born with speed or not. That, no, we no. can improve no. speed. We sure, can improve there's speed. a natural ability there like every sport. But my gosh, it it's when you watch, um, like if I watch videos online or at your camps, there's so many little things that you don't think about to the right. mechanics and like when Sophia used to come out of the blocks like right. when do you want your hands up when right. do you stand exactly. up exactly exactly yeah. and harry groves was an olympic coach several times he was from penn state university and i please i'm not bragging on myself but harry wasn't fond of female coaches <laughs> but he always used to say that i was one of the best sprint technicians in the country oh wow and that That's a was great a compliment, compliment. Yeah. so anytime i went to penn state to work camps I always did the session on body stature, sprint mechanics, you know, where yep. this is supposed to be and so on and so forth. Absolutely. So, and there is, there is a, that is a skill. Yeah. So if, if a parent is thinking like, you know, and let's not even get into how obesity is an epidemic and, and diabetes is, um, you know, hitting our children younger and younger and the nutrition's a whole other side of it. But just physically speaking, um, if your child doesn't, take interest in sports that's fine like their their skill is they're an artist or or they play an instrument but guess what they still need to be in camps like yours because because it only helps you in life and I noticed when I owned my gym as a personal trainer when I trained women for years a woman would come to me 40 50 60 years old do you know I could spot immediately before I even asked them who played a sport in high school or who who even did anything outside did you play kickball did right, you do something exactly exactly because the women that that did not they were not ever active in that manner i had a really hard time as a trainer 
getting their synapses in their brain. Sure. At that age now to understand like the the mechanics of right. what to do. It, have, it was it was shocking to me when I discovered that. I have a great niece who will be two. And oh. her grandparents live next to me, which is my brother and sister in law. And I'll get her out and I'll do A skips down the sidewalk and you should see her try to do them and she's oh. getting better and better. So cute. And just teach kids how to yeah. do things. But just when get you out and skip with right. them. Play sure. hopscotch. Right. Uh, jump oh my gosh Mobility. jumping rope we used to yes. jump rope oh, so yes. much they've got to be favorite. mobile and that's why some kids have some problems too because they're not physically active like you said it doesn't have to be a full-fledged sport and this that you just got to be active i know but you know it makes me sad because as as competitive as i am and you know i am it, it does make me sad that we lost the art of the intram- the intramural sport. Yes, yeah. But you know what? Because I think kids feel but, like, well, I'm not going to be as good as them. Why even go out for the team? But there are so many kids that go to college and are be part of the intramural sports yes. because they're not scholarship athletes. And I think that is wonderful. I love that, too. Yes, I love that, too. I think too. that's great. So they still get to play mm-hmm. a sport that they really enjoy, mm-hmm. even though, you know... They're not the best scholarship athlete. No, it and brings I think them that's joy, great. and that Absolutely. is important. Yes, that is important. Yes. Not everything has to be a competition, and it's and it's, and it's also that camaraderie yes. with other kids. That's that's oh, great. I know. Yep. I know. Where can they find you? What's your website? Um, I have a website called fastmaz.com. Okay, and I'm going to put the link under the video too. Okay. Um, now, because you you're still running camps for local schools and. Right? I, I mostly work with teams. Okay. You mostly I mostly work, work with, teams, with teams. I have several football teams lined up this summer, and um, I was the speed coordinator for all the Little League camps until Little League chose not to do the camps anymore Okay, uh, for a variety of reasons. So those are the kind of things we do. Okay. So let's switch gears because I love this. Let me uh, see. Let me see. That's so cool. I've known you for so long, but I don't know so much about you. I, let me see if I can hold this up to the camera. All right, so how did this book come to be? Well, my niece was working at an advertising firm, and they were interested in a company called Book of Life uh, that originated in England. And people choose to have these books written about themselves for posterity, for their families. Okay, so this company was thinking about doing this as a project. So my niece came to me and said, hey, you know, this is the project. Would you do it? Could we do it on you as the guinea pig? I said, heck no, you're not doing it on me. (laughs) Well, you can see how far that got. So they would send somebody to my home and she would, you know, have questions. And we started with my family and went through the whole my whole career. And they would videotape it and then they would send it to the ghostwriter and they would write it out, send me, um, you know, all the various, um, you know, every chapter, like chapters, chapters uh-huh. and I would have to go through and, you know, make any corrections and so on and so forth. And then they put it together. That is so cool. But I, I want you to, that. I want you to know that on the dedication on the inside, I have here to my family, thank you for your unconditional love and support. Uh, you are my greatest joy, and to my students and athletes, in my wonderful career, your impact transformed my life and enriched it beyond words. Oh, that's mass. Yeah, that that meant a lot to me. That's a beautiful tribute. Yeah, thank you. So it it was a lot about the wonderful. I have been truly, truly blessed with a wonderful career. Any toughness along the way just made me stronger, made me tougher. There is no judgment. It was a different time, a different climate. We're through that. As you said, we're getting that pendulum hopefully in a balanced way. And again, it's not the boots on the ground. No, it's not. We have a responsibility to our kids, Mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility. Yes. That's right. You know, we have a responsibility to our kids. And when we all work in that positive environment to lift our kids, show them, teach them, how to be accountable, how to be responsible, how it is that not everybody gets the same thing. Right. And unfortunately, some people have to work a little bit harder. 
There's no crime in that. No. Teach the kids how to do that. And I want to thank you for hosting these, you know, lifting women up one story at a time. I think that's great. And I think that it shows the idea that you are trying to get that pendulum to swing backwards. Let's look at where we've come from and where we're at. And let's thank all the men that helped us get there. Absolutely. Because they have. Absolutely. I have had so much support from, you know, my professional career. And as I said about Harry Groves. And Harry, I can honestly say, did not like women coaches. Yeah. And do you know why? He was a product of his time. Exactly. And if you're going to hold that against someone, it's only going to hurt you. You're going to be the one that's not going to succeed because you're going to get your panties in a bunch over somebody that was conditioned a certain way. Exactly. Exactly. And it's just not like that. No. Most of all my assistant coaches, and there were only a few over the years, were all men. Yeah. Were all men. Yeah. And they had complete autonomy in the areas that they coached. Mm -hmm. And I had a girl that won the discus one year at States, and my assistant, Jeff, was her coach. And the press ran up to me, hey, hey, hey. I said, oh, no, no, no. You go out. You talk to Jeff. Mm -hmm. Jeff coached her. Mm -hmm. Jeff coached her. Right. He's the one that should comment on her. Yes, I am the head coach. The Mm -hmm. program is under my toolage. He coached her. And again, don't you find, not to keep going, because we've just hit an hour, but I got to say this. Don't you find that people have a hard time with allowing two polarizing or opposite concepts exist simultaneously? Yes. Like, um, yes, uh, women have had a fight over the years on their hands, and there have been trailblazers like you that we're so um, thankful to. However, at the same time, there were a lot of men that were good. Not all men were what received their accolades were responsible for those women not having the opportunities right exactly you know like you've got to see everything all together and they deserve their accolades too and he deserved that and consequently go to him and you know what i love your humble nature and i know a humble person doesn't like to hear that but um you always give credit where credit's due and you you always give 110 percent at whatever you do and it's done from your heart. Thank You're you. not doing it for yep. any any end result. And we all can learn so much for, from that because we talk about right. spiritually. Right. We talk about how hard it is to live in the moment now with because right. we're so distracted everywhere. You, I just like, now I'm having like a light bulb moment. I'm just thinking about this now. You, you really are a, an amazing representation of that because when you're with those kids, you're in the moment. You're not thinking about... Someday they're going to win a state title. You're in the right, moment. exactly. And, you know, especially kids, but people also pick up on that, too. Are you looking me in the eye? Are you in the moment? Are you worried about what we're going to do in the future? Um, and I just respect you for that. Well, thank you so much. I just want to say one thing concerning that. And this is not this is not to to, you know, blow my own horn. One of the girls that I write about in this book was. First of all, I was always accused of spending too much time with the nobodies. Mm. And that that just never, and I write about that in the book. And the other thing was I talk about in the book of a young girl that ran for me that was not talented. Every day she was out there working, working, working. And all the kids knew her well. And one time she ran the 100-meter dash and she PR'd. And she looked up in the bleachers and she yelled, Maz, I PR'd, I PR'd. Oh. The whole team stood up and clapped and cheered. And her PR wasn't something to sneeze at, but it was a big deal for For her. her. And we all acknowledged it. And, you know, she had children that went to the school where I taught, and she would always stop in to see me. Oh, yeah. So that's that's those are the about. nice stories. Though that is what it's. And about. in case anybody's wondering, unfortunately, you can't get your book. No, and only no. a certain amount of copies were made. Right. But I, I would like to borrow it and read sure. it. Sure. I just want to thank you, absolutely. So much thank for you doing so this. much and this making a difference for everyone, not just women. Well, with and your accomplishments. likewise, right back at you for what you're doing here. Thank I you. I appreciate it.